Continuing with reproductive anatomy, let's go ahead and take a look at the female reproductive system in terms of its anatomical structures. So we'll start with the uh, female reproductive system looking at the external genitalial openings or the vaginal openings in which we will see to the most anterior side the mons pubis. We have two additional openings that we might see within this region that are within the uh, triangles of the pubic or anal regions, which includes the urethra opening as well as the anus, which are separate from the actual reproductive openings. Just posterior to the mons pubis, we will get the propus. The propus is going to be a section of skin that will be covering most of the vestibule region. Just posterior to the propus, we will get the glans clitoris, at least the visible part of the clitoris. We will then get to the labius, which includes the labia majora and the labia minora. Internal to the labia minora, we get the vestibule. In between the labia minora and the vestibule, we will get the vestibular glands. And then central to the vestibule, we will see the vaginal orifice or the opening to the vagina itself. So let's continue looking at the female reproductive organs here looking at the internal structures within the abdominal pelvic cavity. And we'll start with the opening of the uh, vagina within the uh, labias, where we'll have the labia majora and labia minora surrounding the vaginal orifice. To the anterior side, we'll see the external urethral orifice. And anterior to that, we will see the clitoris, which is going to contain the spongy tissues connected to the suspensory ligament. Just internal to the vaginal orifice, we will see a set of secretory glands. These set of secretory glands is referred to as Skene's gland. Skene's gland is highly linked with immune functions and will produce a highly viscous mucus around the vaginal orifice so as to protect the vagina. We will then get to the vagina. The vagina is going to be comprised of smooth muscle. There's going to be a muscularis layer. And then there will be a mucosa layer made up of primarily of stratified non-keratinized squamal epithelial cells, along with some secretory epithelial cells contained within it. At the apex of the vagina, we will get to the cervix of the uterus. The cervix of the uterus is a uh, sphincter that is going to be separating the uterus itself from the vagina. We get to the uterus. We'll take a look here in a second at the regions of the uterus. Connecting to the uterus, we will get the fallopian tube, sometimes referred to as the uterine tubes. At the end of the fallopian tubes, we will get to the fimbrae, which are going to be finger-like projections coming off of the fallopian tube. On top of these finger-like projections are the uh, large cilial projections that over-encompass the ovary so as to move the ovulate that is being ruptured from the ovary into the fallopian tube, which will then take it to the uterus itself. If we look at the actual uterus and structures contained within the uterus, we start with the vagina and the cervix interacting with each other. Remember the cervix here is a sphincter that's going to control the diameter opening of the uterus. Within the uterus, we have three distinct tissue layers. We have the endometrial tissue layer, which is gonna be pri primarily epithelial cells. We will have cuboidal as well as squamal epithelial cells. In there, we will have some secretory cells as well as some glandular tissue, which we refer to as the uterine glands. Just outside or just superficial, depending upon how you wanna look at the anatomical orientation of this, will be the myometrium. Myometrium is gonna be predominantly smooth muscle. There will be nerves and blood vessels heading in through the myometrium as well as the endometrium. Encompassing the entirety of the cervix is the parametrium. Stemming away from the uterus itself, we see the fallopian tubes with the fimbrae surrounding the ovaries. Now you gotta remember that the ovaries are gonna sit within the fimbrae, but they're not gonna be directly connected to the fimbrae itself. Within the uterus itself, we have a fundicle region. 
and a bodial region. The implantation is going to occur at the junction point between the fundus and the body of uterus. We get what's referred to as the intrauterine cavity, which is the open space within the uterus itself. This is where what will be expanding during pregnancy to allow for expansion of the endometrium as the fetus that has been implanted will expand during its growth phase. As the body starts to taper towards the cervix, we get two distinct regions. We get the internal os, and then we get the isthmus of the cervix. The internal, the internal os and isthmus of the cervix lead to the surface itself, and then the external os, which is going to be the connection point with the vagina. If we look at it in terms of the connective tissue that's going to be surrounding all of the organs, these organs are being held in place by what's referred to as the broad ligament. The broad ligament is going to support all of the excretory organs that are passing through the abdominal pelvic structures as well, which includes the, the ureter and urinary bladder. One of the reasons why females who have hysterectomies have an increased risk of prolapse within the uh, urinary bladder is because of the loss of the broad ligament. The broad ligament is going to house all of the organs within it, which includes the uterus, the fallopian tube, as well as the fimbrae. The junction point between the fallopian or uterine tube and fimbrae is referred to as the infundibulum. The infundibulum is simply just a, an increased sac region within an organ. So we'll see infundibulums in other organs as well. The broad ligament contains a secondary ligament set within it. The secondary set within it is going to be the suspensor ligaments and the ovary ligament. The ovary ligament is going to connect the ovary itself to the junction point of or the hornal point of the uterus where the fallopian or uterine tube is going to junction with the fundicle region of the uterus. This ovarian ligament has some muscles that are connected to that fundic area within the uterus that during ovulation will allow for a contraction to take place and a rearrangement of the ovary so that the uh, ejecting ovulate will be lined up with the luminal center of the uh, fimbrae and infundibulum of the fallopian tube. The suspensory ligament is going to house the ovarian arteries and veins. It's also going to house the ovarian nerve. Within the broad ligament, we will have a housing of various other arteries and veins, which includes the uterine artery and the uterine vein. During pregnancy, we will get an anastomotic angiogenic process, which means we're going to get more uterine arteries and more uterine veins that will supply an increased amount of blood into the endometrium necessary for uh, gestation to occur. If we go ahead and take a look at the connection points between the ovary and all of the connective tissue within the broad ligament, we will have the mesophallic area, the area of the broad ligament is going to connect the uh, ovarian ligament to the broad ligament itself. We will then have the mesoverum, which is going to connect to the helum of the ovary. This is what's actually going to be connecting the ovarian ligament to the actual uterus itself, surrounded by the tunicas, which include the tunica albicans. Within the ovary itself, we will have a cortical region. The cortical region is where we will see the ovulates forming. And then we have a medulla region. The medulla region is where we will see all of the blood vessels heading into and coming out of the ovary. It's within this medulla region and within the cortical medulla region of the ovary that we will see all of the secretory cells that are responsible for producing the reproductive organs for the female. 